Hello, and welcome to the pre-recorded version of our June 23rd Bible study. This will also be presented in person on June 23rd. Pastor Nolan has shared with us his interest in collecting unique postcards. In this once a month series, we will study the four very short postcard sized one chapter books in our New Testament. Our first postcard is the letter to Philemon. Philemon has only 25 verses. If you're using a physical Bible instead of an app, you can find Philemon by flipping past 1st and 2nd Thessalonians and 1st and 2nd Timothy. And when you land on Hebrews, flip back one page. When we lived in Seattle, I was a reporter for the Northwest Christian Times. In newspaper writing, we always look for character and setting, all the pieces that help us understand the story that we're getting ready to tell. So in looking at Bible passages, I like to follow the same formula of what they call five W's and an H. It's who, what, where, when, why, and how. This framework is also used in police and judicial investigations. So let's investigate the Apostle Paul's letter to Philemon. First, we'll look at who are the people we're introduced to in the first three verses of Philemon. Well, the first, of course, is the Apostle Paul as the author of the letter. In fact, he's the writer of many of the New Testament letters seven of his 13 letters were written from prisons. You can see in this piece of a picture by Rembrandt, his vision of the Apostle Paul thinking very carefully through what he wants to include and how it should be worded in his letters. The next character we meet in this introduction, Paul's greeting, the first three verses, is Philemon. He's a wealthy Greek Christian and the Colossi church meets in Philemon's house. We also are introduced to Timothy who is including his greeting. Timothy is apparently visiting and or helping Paul there in prison in Rome. Timothy is Paul's young son in the faith, very beloved by Paul. Timothy had a Greek dad and a Jewish mom, by the way. And Timothy was not only with him when he wrote Philemon, he was also with Paul when he wrote 2 Corinthians and Philippians and Colossians and 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. Two other characters that we're not as familiar with are Aphia, possibly the wife of Philemon, who had a great reputation for hospitality. So Paul has heard about her reputation. The other is Archippus. Commentators often believe that he is either a son or other relative Philemon with Philemon and living with them in their house, or that he is the leader of the church at Colossae that meets in Philemon's house. He could be both a relative and the leader of the church of Colossae that meets in Philemon's house. So now let's look at when. When was this letter written? When did this drama unfold? Paul has completed his first mission trip, which is the blue line. His second trip, which is the green line. His third is the purple. And this in his, is his final trip. He is a prisoner during this trip. It's the reddish orange line that takes him to Rome. Paul is writing this letter, Philemon and the letter to Colossians during his Roman imprisonment, which lasted approximately two years. Philemon was written about AD 60, possibly as late as 62. And you can look at a timeline in the last four chapters of the book of Acts. Now let's look at who else is mentioned as we look to verses four through seven. We meet Onesimus. Onesimus is a runaway slave. He's hiding in crowded Rome. We also meet Tychicus. 
Tychicus was assigned by Paul to accompany Onesimus with the letter to Philemon, Onesimus' master, and the letter to the Colossian church. So the letters Philemon and Colossians are being carried by Onesimus, accompanied by Tychicus, to be delivered to the Colossi church, probably while it was in a meeting at Philemon's house. These would be safety factors for Onesimus. As a runaway slave, he could have been intercepted by any Roman officer and immediately executed because he was simply a Roman slave and was a runaway. Rome was built on more than 60 million slaves in the Roman Empire, more than their own citizenry. And runaways were dealt with extremely harshly by Rome, with or without the slave owner's permission. So where is Paul now? Paul is in Rome under house arrest. This likely means that there are chains around Paul's ankles. With Paul there in chains in prison is Epaphras, who Paul mentions near the end of this letter. Paul, even though he's under house arrest, is still free to proclaim Christ to anyone who visits him. And Paul tells us in a different letter, in the letter to Philippians and the church at Philippi, that his prison time actually helps further the gospel because he can write letters of instruction and correction and he can witness to anyone who visits him. Somehow, Onesimus comes into contact with Paul and Paul leads him to Christ. It's interesting that Onesimus' name means useful or profitable. And Philemon's name means affectionate or one who is kind. And Paul uses this later in his letters. Excuse me a moment. Talking makes me thirsty. So what is Paul's stated purpose for writing this particular New Testament postcard? If you look at these pictures, these are from um, medieval Bibles. On one side, you see Paul pictured handing the letter to Onesimus. Tychicus didn't make it into the picture. And you can tell Paul because he has the halo around his head, very typical in medieval drawings um, and in this illustrated manuscript. And if you see in the capital P there uh, for the beginning of Paul's name, the letter to Philemon by Paul, that is blown up over on the other side of your screen. You see again, see Paul has this halo around his head. And you see Onesimus delivering the letter to Philemon. And you can tell Onesimus is the little one in the middle. And Onesimus is believed to have been a very young slave. And you can tell he's a slave because in this medieval illustration, the center of his head is shaved. This was used in medieval times to designate a slave and monks picked this up and designated themselves as slaves to Christ. So I, I found that little detail interesting. I hope you do too. Now, Paul is a very, very well-educated expert with words. We know this from his addresses in Athens and when he addresses various judges um, before and during imprisonments. Um, Paul begins by building rapport with Philemon and greeting the church that meets in Philemon's, Philemon's house. Paul likes to use the terms co-workers or fellow laborers, and he did this not only in the letter to Philemon, he does it in Romans 16, Philippians 2, and Colossians 4. So then Paul begins, after his greetings, to develop this multi-point case for Philemon to forgive and receive Onesimus. And Paul will even ask Philemon to send Onesimus back to him for aid while he is in prison and 
probably, so Paul can further teach Onesimus in the gospel. Now, Roman law allows Paul to do this because there is an advocacy clause in Roman law. Paul would know this as a Roman citizen. This advocacy clause allows a runaway slave to secure support from a master's friend. And some slaves after this advocacy hearing would be accepted back. Some even made a part of the family, adopted into the family. Now, Paul is asking Philemon to send Onesimus back to him, which we would think would be very difficult for Philemon. So let's look at this, Paul's request, and the case that he builds for Onesimus's second chance. <clears throat> I'm going to shrink my little picture up here so that you can see the words better. Paul says in verses 8 through 11, We begin the what here for a couple of slides. Paul says, I could order you Philemon, but I prefer to appeal on the basis of love. Then he reminds Philemon, I, Paul, I am old and I am a prisoner for Christ. A little perspective for Philemon and perhaps some sympathy for Paul. He says, I am appealing for my child in the faith. Onesimus, he's my very heart. He was once useless. Remember, Onesimus' name means useful. He said, but he's now become useful to us both. So Onesimus has become Onesimus because he has accepted Christ. He's become our brother in the faith. Then he continues in verse 12. He says, even though I would like to keep him, he is my very heart, I'm sending him back to you. But I would prefer to keep him. He could take your place in helping me in prison. Like Philemon really wants to go to prison to help Paul. He said, but I could use Onesimus. I wouldn't do it without your consent though. He wants it to be voluntary, out of brotherly love and forgiveness love for Paul, forgiveness for Onesimus on Philemon's sake. Then in verse 15, Paul continues, perhaps Onesimus left so that he could find Christ. I find this interesting too, because recall Mordecai when he talked to Esther in the Old Testament and said, well, perhaps this is the whole reason you've come to this position is to save the Jewish nation from slaughter. So this, this becomes uh, almost, almost humorous as you read this case that Paul is building for Onesimus with Philemon. So Paul continues, he says, again, Onesimus is very dear to me and to you now as a brother in Christ, how Philemon should be feeling now. He should be happy for Onesimus that he's found Christ. And then Paul says, if you consider me a partner, well, a partner in what? A partner in the faith and sharing the faith. He said, welcome Onesimus as you would me. Well, how would Philemon welcome Paul? Not with a vindictive spirit. He would be joyful and open armed. So again, Paul is not so subtly hinting how Philemon should be receiving this postcard for Onesimus' sake. As we continue with the what's that Paul is asking of Philemon, then Paul takes another tack. He says, if Onesimus has wronged you in any way, or if he owes you anything. This is where we get the hint that Onesimus may have stolen something, perhaps to fund his flight to Rome. Paul says, I'm writing this with my very own hand. I will repay you. And, and then he says, of course, Philemon, 
you owe me your very life. I take this to mean his Christian life. Um, and Paul says, I want some benefit from you in the Lord. So refresh, refresh my heart in Christ. Paul still wants Philemon to not only forgive Onesimus, but to send Onesimus back to him as a helper and most likely to learn more about the Christian faith. Then in verse 21, another underscore in this several point case that Paul is building. I'm confident of your obedience. So I'm writing you knowing you'll do even more than I'm asking. What could Paul be hinting at here? Perhaps to free Onesimus. Perhaps Paul wants to even see if Onesimus will return to him of his own free will. Um, and then, as if everything he's already said isn't enough, Paul says, oh, and one more thing, Philemon. Prepare a guest room for me. I hope to be freed from prison as you've been praying and I want to come and visit you. In other words, Paul will find out what Philemon does, whether or not Onesimus has ever returned to him. This, this is, I'm sorry, I just find the way Paul does this practically humorous. So <clears throat> now that he's heard the who and when and where and what. Let's look at why. Why is this a huge request? Well, again, remember the Roman Empire is built on slaves. A runaway slave is a dangerous thing. If Paul was caught harboring a runaway slave, he could be executed as well. This letter makes Paul an advocate for the runaway slave which falls within Roman law. Now, Philemon has a few problems. What would the other masters think if he's too easy on Onesimus, especially unsaved um, Christians who own slaves, which was so extremely common in the Roman Empire? What would other slaves do? Would they claim, oh, I've found Christ too, therefore anything I do that's wrong, you have to forgive me. On the other hand, if Philemon goes ahead and punishes Onesimus, how does it affect his Christian testimony? These are all difficult questions and Paul's letter and this strong case that he builds help solve these problems for Paul, for Onesimus and for Philemon and sets a good example for the other believers in the Colossae church. So, why is Philemon important for us today? Well, we are introduced to the idea of koinonia, this partnership in the faith. We're introduced to the importance of forgiveness and reconciliation with our Christian brothers and sisters. Paul shows us Christ by demonstrating the second chances of redeeming love. And Paul continues to help distant Christians feel valued and to connect with each other in both the greetings at the beginnings of his letters and in the closing. Remember, he included Timothy in the greeting, but he, in the closing in these last two verses, he says, Epaphras is with me. He is in chains also, and he sends his greeting. Also Mark, this is John Mark, originally estranged from Paul, now a beloved helper. Also Aristarchus and Demas are witnesses to this letter and its purpose. And Luke, we know Luke from the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts. So Paul also shows Philemon there are witnesses to the writing of this letter and its intended purpose. Just to add another piece to the case that Paul makes to Philemon. <clears throat> now, there is um, the how that we look at now, the who, what, where, when, why, and the how. How do we apply these principles in our lives today? Well, koinonia, pretty obvious. 
only evangelism and mission and relief efforts, activities in our churches, community, and wider areas of service. But most especially, and what touches really my heart, is praying for persecuted Christians. Um, you can get Voice of the Martyrs website or their magazine is free. Open Doors website. Find out what's happening to our Christian brothers and sisters around the world that are under heavy persecution, that are looking for Christian Bibles in variety of forms, not just written Bibles. There are even places you can donate old flash drives and old SD cards to have uh, Bibles put on them. And hopefully that doesn't give that away to anyone <laughs> that would use that for the wrong purposes. Um, the other way to apply these principles is forgiveness and restoration within our Christian community. It's so easy to have falling outs with each other in our churches or between denominations. And Paul is pointing out how this harmony and cooperation among Christians is so very important. It's part of our witness to the world on what it means to be a Christian. So as we wrap that up, if you're old enough to remember Paul Harvey and the rest of the story, you may find this little detail interesting. As we move on from what happens in the 60s AD and then the first century of the church where Timothy was a leader of the church in Ephesus. We move on to the second century of the church worldwide. There is a fellow named Ignatius Theophorus. He was overseer of the church of Antioch and became a Christian martyr in AD 140. He wrote many, many letters to the churches of Asia Minor during his extradition trip to Rome for execution, just as Paul was, although Ignatius didn't get to stay in prison for two years waiting for them to decide. But he wrote many, many letters during that very long trip, if you remember the map. One of the letters that he wrote during a travel stop in Smyrna, remember these, many of the legs of the trip were by ship, and they had to stop for winter, for weather, and so on. Well, during a travel stop at Smyrna, Ignatius writes a letter to the church at Ephesus. In this letter, in chapter one of a rather long letter, Ignatius includes many, many glowing comments about the leader then of the church at Ephesus. The leader's name is Onesimus, and Ignatius makes the same pun on Onesimus's name that Paul did in the letter to Philemon. He said, Onesimus, useful. Onesimus is Onesimus by name and Onesimus by nature. So early Christian historians believe that Onesimus did return to Paul, either returned as still Philemon's slave or returned on his own accord as a freed man, was further trained in the Christian faith by Paul, Paul and eventually became leader of the church at Ephesus in the second century. Isn't that an interesting addendum to studying this postcard to Philemon? I hope you've enjoyed this introduction. And I hope you will go read the book of Philemon while it's still fresh on your mind and enjoy how Paul crafts his pleas for Onesimus' sake. God bless you and have a great rest of your week.